And with that, it's all yours. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Stacy, uh, And thank you to the California Fire Science Consortium for hosting this webinar. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss some of the research uh, that I did uh, while completing my master's degree at the University of Minnesota. Um, I studied butterfly behavior, occupancy, and abundance um, after a major fire that had occurred in California. And this, the purpose of this webinar is to discuss uh, some of the results from that research. Uh, a little background about myself. Stacy had already kind of given uh, everyone a background about myself. But like she said, I graduated from Northern Michigan University. Uh, for two years following that, I did acted as a contract biologist. Um, I worked various uh, research organizations throughout Alaska, uh, including on the North Slope, and did some seabird research. Uh, I've worked in California, Nevada, Wyoming, Michigan, Florida, pretty much all over. And most of my background is in uh, bird research. Uh, however, I kind of wanted to expand my horizons, um, and I went back to grad. I went to school at the University of Minnesota and decided to work on uh, butterflies after a fire. And my thesis work can be broken into two main chapters. Uh, in the first chapter, we looked at uh, what sugars, the composition of sugars and nectar sources that butterflies were using. And in the second chapter, we looked at environmental factors that we thought might be affecting butterfly occupancy, uh, abundance, and we also looked at various nectar attributes in this chapter as well. Um, and we also looked at how fire severity, both vegetation fire severity and soil burn severity, um, was affecting those environmental factors that butterflies were keying in on after a fire. This figure is just to give you an idea of where our study area was. And so we were working in the rim fire which occurred in the Sierra Nevada of California. The green outline here is Yosemite National Park. And just to the west is the, in the red is the outline of the rim fire as of August 21st. So obviously this, uh, the fire went through October, so it was much larger. Um, but this is where we work, right outside of Yosemite National Park on the west side there, uh, within the boundary of the rim fire. And the fire occurred from August to October 2013. Uh, we started doing our, conducting our research the following summer. Uh, this was, at the time, one of the largest known fires to occur in California history, uh, at least since accurate um, fire records have been kept. And it burned over 140, 1,040 square kilometers. And there were a few reasons why we decided to study butterflies after a fire. Uh, we know that historical fire suppression has led to widespread ecological changes, especially in places that burn frequently, like in California. Uh, we're now seeing more frequent large-scale fires, likely as a result of increases in fuel loads from that fire suppression uh, and global climate change. And right now, it's relatively unknown how many species, including butterflies, are going to respond to these more frequent large-scale fires. So the rim fire really gave us an opportunity to start exploring how butterflies might be affected um, by, by large-scale fires in California. And additionally, fire is used as a management tool for several endangered and threatened species of butterflies throughout the United States. Um, and if we can get a better understanding of how fire is affecting environmental attributes uh, that butterflies are keying in on, uh, we might be able to help these projects be more successful or more productive in, uh, in their conservation efforts. So here's just a very basic uh, life history figure uh, of a butterfly. So adult butterfly, the top there, uh, lay eggs usually on a specific host plant, but some species are generalists and will lay on many different uh, uh, plant sources. Those eggs then hatch into a caterpillar, which then feeds on the host plant. Uh, 
Um, when it's time and the caterpillar has, is ready, they undergo metamorphosis in a chrysalis until they hatch and become an adult butterfly. And for some species, this process can take up to a year or even longer. Um, but with this in mind, I wanted to highlight this because we are focusing solely on the adult life stage of the butterfly. And so butterflies in the adult stage may only be in that stage for several weeks, uh, which is a very small portion of this entire life cycle. And so as we go throughout this presentation, keep in mind that we are studying just this adult life stage. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the first section of my research focuses on uh, the sugars that are present in nectar sources that butterflies were using after this fire. <clears throat> we know that uh, some or most adult butterflies like nectar. As a general rule, this is true. Uh, some species don't take nectar at all as an adult, but generally speaking, most butterflies feed on nectar. And there's research that suggests that the abundance of nectar sources is important for the population size, survival, and fecundity of some species of butterflies. So when nectar sources are limited, for some species, population sizes will also be limited. Uh, the adult survival rates will decrease, and fecundity will decrease as well. Uh, and so as nectar sources increase, uh, butterfly population sizes can increase, adult survival can increase, and the amount of offspring that these butterflies are producing can also increase. So it's, it's very important in the adult life cycle stage. Nectar is composed of uh, three main components, waters, sugars, and amino acids. But ne not all nectar is created equally. And in most nectar sources, there are three main types of sugar, which are sucrose, glucose, and fructose. Um, the composition of these three sugars within the nectar source varies by each species. We also know that fire affects nectar. Uh, there's, a there's a bunch of literature that states that the abundance, the volume, and the concentration of nectar is highest in the first few years following a fire. So the actual abundance of those nectar sources tends to increase after a fire. The volume of the nectar within those nectar sources increases, and the concentration of the sugar within each of those nectar sources increases as well. And that's one of the reasons why prescribed fire uh, for butterfly management, especially endangered species, um, tends to be somewhat successful. Um, the prescribed fire is usually used to um, increase our uh, focuses on two things in regards to these butterflies, which is their host plant abundance and the nectar source abundance. And there's also some literature that suggests the actual sugars in the nectar sources that butterflies um, are, are gravitating towards can determine if the species will be seen using it frequently or not. And so in the lab setting where most things are controlled, butterflies have been seen to gravitate towards the sucrose sugars more than glucose and fructose. But is this realistic? Uh, do we expect these butterflies to show similar preferences in a natural setting? Um, most studies also failed to offer mixtures of the sugars to butterflies, and we're just offering them pure solutions of each of the sugars. Um, and these butterflies relatively had equal uh, access to these resources and laboratory experiments. And this probably doesn't represent what butterflies are actually have available to them in a natural setting. So we wanted to know what nectar sources butterflies are using in a natural setting. And 
To answer this question, we examined whether nectar source use was associated with the total sugar mass from those sources, the total sucrose mass from those sources, or the proportion of sucrose to the total sugars from those sources. And when I say nectar use, I'm just talking about how often we saw a species of butterfly using that plant or using that nectar source. So in 2014, the first summer following the rim fire, we established eight transects within the rim fire boundaries. In 2015, we added an additional four transects. Each transect ranged from 300 to 500 meters in length, and we further separated those into 20 meter segments. And so if you can see on this picture here, this red line that's broken up into segments here, just imagine that we were walking down that path where the transect line was, and then each of those represents a 20 meter segment. We surveyed each of the transects five times throughout the course of the season. During our butterfly surveys on these transects, we recorded every individual that was within 10 meters of the transect line, so every individual butterfly we identified, and then we noted if that species was taking nectar, and if so, what nectar source it was using. For our vegetation sampling, we randomly selected a one meter square in each of those 20 meter segments. And within that one meter square, we measured the total canopy cover, uh, which was the above ground, um, the overstory canopy. And we used a spherical densiometer to measure this. We also measured the percent of live ground cover in that one meter square. And then we recorded the number of florets of every known nectar source that butterflies were known to be using in the rim fire. We did some additional nectar sampling. So for each of the species that butterflies were known to be using, we collected five florets uh, from multiple plants. And before we collected them, we bagged them with a fine mesh cloth overnight and attached them to these florets with a rubber band. And this was just to exclude um, any insects or invertebrates that might uh, take the nectar and allow these plants to regenerate their nectar overnight. Uh, the following day, we collected these florets and put each one in a 30 milliliter vial that contained two milliliters of distilled water we shook it up to wash the nectar out of the floret, and then ultimately transferred them to a negative 80 degree Celsius freezer for further analysis. So we chose this method because the volume of the nectar in the sources that butterflies were using in the rim fire was too low for tra uh, traditional methods of uh, measuring nectar abundance. And so we used high performance liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry to analyze the three main sugars uh, that were found in these nectar sources. So in order to quantify the sugars in each sample, since we didn't have any idea um, of the volume or concentration of these sugars, uh, we needed to prepare calibration curves with known concentrations uh, that were prepared in the lab for each sugar. So this figure here is an example of what a concentration curve uh, for fructose might look like. And as you can see, as the concentration increases, so does the peak area, which I'll get to uh, in the next slide here. So this is an example of the peaks that show in the mass spectrometry uh, this represents the leftmost peak would represent sucrose, fructose, and then glucose. Um, and by measuring that area under each of those curves, we can then compare that to the area from from this uh, calibration curve to estimate the concentration of those sugars in each of our samples. Since we use two milliliters of distilled water, in the sample collection, we can multiply the concentration by two. 
to calculate the sugar mass from each of our samples. We use linear regression to test whether the intensity of use or how many times a butterfly was using a specific nectar source was associated with total sugar mass, total sucrose mass, or the relative proportion of sucrose to the overall sugars. And it sounds like someone just, sorry, I just wanted to remind someone uh, joined the audio free phone, which is great, but just please make sure that you do mute your phone. Uh, we're getting some feedback issues. Um, I'm going to... Sorry for that little technical hiccup by. there. Um, okay, I think we're all set. You will now be placed into conference. From our sample, sugar mass ranged for each species ranged from 0 0.004 to 0 0.9 milligrams. This figure shows intensity of use on the x-axis and the total sugar in each source on the y-axis. You can see here as intensity of use or the number of times a butterfly was using a nectar source increases, um, there's no relationship between intensity of use and the total sugar that was found in those nectar sources. A similar figure here, intensity of use against sugar or sucrose mass. So this is time we're just looking at the amount of sucrose in our samples. And again, there's absolutely no relationship between intensity of use and the sucrose mass in our in our known nectar sources. And finally, intensity of use against the proportion of sugars that is sucrose. In those samples, uh, again, there's no relationship between intensity of use and the measure of sugar that is sucrose in our sources. So overall conclusions for this section are that we found no evidence for nectar use based on any of the three sugar content analyses that we conducted. Um, and this makes sense to us. Um, a lot of butterflies are generalists, um, at least in the field. And so in this natural setting, this matched well with what we um, as observers saw. Butterflies tended to use whatever nectar sources were available to them at the time um, and where they were in space. And this also sh uh, shows that the lab experiments that were conducted are not represent, representative of uh, the natural setting or what we see butterflies doing in a natural setting. We did see that nectar is widely available after a fire. Like I had mentioned before, um, studies suggest that the first few years following a fire, nectar sources tend to be most abundant. Um, and that definitely seemed true in our, uh, in our study area. Uh, we had 20 nectar sources. We saw just in our uh, 8 or 12 transects, we saw 315 observations of nectar use. Uh, nectar did seem to be widely available. Um, we also saw that butterflies can be quite abundant in the years following a fire. Uh, we had you know, thousands of individuals in the second year of our study, the second summer following. Uh, and fire, like I had mentioned before, fire is used for um, butterfly nectar source management for several endangered species. Um, if we had found evidence that butterflies were selecting certain sugars or certain nectar attributes, then um, these managers may be able to use that to plant uh, certain species that have certain nectar attributes. But since we didn't find any evidence for nectar use um, for this whole assemblage of butterflies, um, it suggests that 
the way that the management is now may be sufficient if nectar sources truly are increasing after a fire. So there may not be a need to um, select certain sources based on certain sugar preferences. Um, however, butterflies may be more attracted to native than non-native nectar sources. Uh, some literature has suggested that butterflies prefer native sources, um, and only two of the nectar sources that we saw in the rim fire uh, were non-native species. And so the other 18 that butterflies were using were all native species. Um, so fire may be able to restore habitat that has been degraded if invasive species or non-native species um, have degraded that habitat to improve the overall um, butterfly habitat for the species in question. The next chapter of my thesis involved examining environmental factors that we hypothesized could affect butterfly occupancy um, and abundance after a fire. And like I had mentioned before, we also examined whether fire severity uh, was affecting those environmental factors that butterflies are keying in on. So we had two main questions in this section that we wanted to answer. We wanted to know why are butterflies found where they are after a fire? What environmental factors are determining um, the spatial distribution of these butterflies that we see after a fire? Specifically, we wanted to know do environmental attributes affect the occupancy status of a butterfly or the abundance or both? And does fire severity, uh, both vegetation and soil burn severity, have an effect on those environmental attributes that are affecting butterfly occupancy and abundance? So we use two measures of uh, burn severity. We looked at the vegetation burn severity, which is um, basically a measure of how much above ground vegetation was burned after a fire, and a soil burn severity measure uh, that we got from the U.S. Forest Service, uh, which is basically how severe the soil um, underneath that vegetation was burned. And this, I'm just going to give a brief overview of occupancy modeling, uh, trying not to get too bogged down with the specifics here. Um, basically, when you conduct a survey, very few species are ever seen 100% of the time, um, even if they are actually present in that survey area. So you may not see them, but they are there. Um, and occupancy modeling can be used by visiting the same site that you're surveying multiple times um, and then it can give you an estimate of the proportion of sites that are actually occupied by a species, whether or not you saw it there. So it, it aims to improve on the estimate of where species are. And occupancy modeling for butterflies has historically been difficult um, due to some of the key assumptions of occupancy modeling, um, but more recently, there have been increases in the ability to use occupancy modeling uh, with the addition of a few parameters to the model, which allows us to more accurately estimate um, the parameter of interest there for, for butterflies. There are two main components to occupancy models. Detection, which is just the probability of seeing a species at a site if it's actually present there when you're doing the survey. And then the occupancy uh, part, which is the expected probability that a species is present um, at a given site, whether or not you see it. So we use occupancy models with relaxed closure. Um, we included parameters on detection probability that we thought might affect whether or not we saw um, a butterfly at a specific site. And so parameters we included were survey-specific number of florets and the visit number, which is just visit one through five, uh, because we visited five times. And it just accounts for the phenology of the butterfly. And 
covariates that we included on the occupancy part of the modeling included canopy cover, the amount of wide ground cover, and then two different nectar attributes, which were the categorical nectar abundance and uh, the total number of florets. So we have a categorical measure here, and then we have a continuous measure that we also included. In the first step of modeling, uh, we examined covariate effects on the probability of entry, departure, and detection for butterflies, and we just held, this, uh, held the occupancy part of the modeling constant. Uh, from that step, we retained the highest or most parsimonious model, and then went on to step two of modeling, uh, which included adding covariate effects on the probability of occupancy. We also wanted to know if these environmental factors were affecting the abundance of the species we saw, not just the occupancy status, but the actual abundance of the butterflies. So to answer this question, we use negative binomial generalized linear models uh, to analyze the effect of canopy cover, live ground cover, number of florets, and again, the categorical abundance of nectar, see if any of those had an influence on the abundance of the butterflies that we saw in our study areas. And then to analyze the fire severity effects on those environmental factors, we used ANOVA, and we looked at both vegetation and soil burn severity. Um, the categories for each of these, this was a categorical measure of vegetation and soil burn severity range from none, low, moderate, to high. And we wanted to know if these measures, vegetation and soil burn severity measures, had any impact on the canopy cover, the amount of live ground cover, um, and the amount of nectar, or the number of florets that were available to butterflies. Um, like I had mentioned earlier, uh, we recorded a total of 45 species of butterfly over the study. Um, in 2014, we only had sufficient data to model the occupancy of Icaricea lupini. Um, but in 2015, we had sufficient data to model for Icaricea lupini, Phaseoides mylita, Coleus erythmi, Arenus perseus, and Junonia quinia. So these are our five focal species. So this table shows the effect of each of these covariates, um, the survey-specific number of florets and the visit number, on detecting each one of our focal species. So need, for two species, nothing that we included in our models was associated with detecting that species. So coleus erythmi and lupini in 2014. However, as the number of florets increase. In 2015, the probability of detecting Icaricea lupini increased as well. Um, and the visit number, which again just accounts for the phenology of the butterfly or when they're actually uh, flying in the, during the season, affected the probability of detecting Junonia coenia, Phaseoides mylita, and Arenus perseus. A similar table here, um, on the top we have the covariates that we included in um, the occupancy modeling. Um, so as canopy cover increased, the probability that four of our species were actually present at a site decreased. So as canopy cover increased, the probability of occupancy of Eurythmi, Lupini, Mylita, and Perseus decreased. As live ground cover increased, uh, the probability of occupancy of Eurythmi, Lupini, Kalenia, and Mylita increased. And as the number of florets, this continuous measure here, increased, the probability of occupancy of Lupini in 2014 and Perseus increased as well. And so you see categorical nectar was never included in the highest ranked or most parsimonious model um, during our modeling process. But we also wanted to know whether a continuous measure of nectar availability could better predict occupancy for these species than a categorical nectar 
measure. Uh, previous occupancy studies have included this categorical nectar abundance. Um, and so we wanted to expand on that and see if perhaps a continuous measure would be able to better predict the occupancy. And as we can see here, we compared uh, univariate models, including one of each of these covariates. And in every case, um, the continuous measure, the number of florets, was a better predictor of occupancy than was this categorical uh, nectar availability. So we then looked at the same environmental factors and how they were influencing the abundance of the species that we studied. And if there's a gray box, uh, a dark gray highlighted box, that means that that, um, that covariate for that species was included, it affected the abundance and it affected the occupancy status of the species. So as the canopy cover increased, the abundance of Coleus eurythmi, Icarus e. lupini, Mylitta, and Perseus also in, or as canopy cover increased, the abundance of those species decreased. And live ground cover was associated with the abundance of all of the species that we studied. So as live ground cover increased, the abundance of all of our focal species increased, which makes sense. Categorical abundance of nectar was associated with the abundance of four species, and the number of florets, as the number of florets increased, the abundance of three of our species increased as well. I know this is a lot of information, so I'm going to summarize it up after, um, after, this, after these fire severity results. So in 2014, uh, we looked at vegetation severity and how it affected those same environmental factors that were affecting butterfly uh, abundance and occupancy. And in 2014, um, the unburned vegetation severity category had more overstory canopy than the low, moderate, and high severity categories, which makes sense. So areas that weren't burned had more overstory canopy than all of the other areas that actually were affected by the fire. In 2015, uh, the same vegetation severity, uh, unburned had the lowest or the highest canopy cover value, uh, which was significantly greater than the low category, which was significantly greater than the moderate, and the high burn severity for vegetation had the lowest canopy cover, which again makes sense. And moderate and high vegetation severity categories had the greatest amount of live ground cover uh, the first two years following the fire. And the high vegetation burn category had a significantly greater amount of uh, florets of the nectar sources than unburned and low vegetation severity categories. So we see here this trend of moderate and high um, and high vegetation burn severity having the greatest effect on live ground cover and number of florets. What about soil burn severity? In 2014, soil burn severity um, didn't seem to have an effect or at least a significant effect on any of the uh, covariates that we looked at. But in 2015, in the unburned and low soil burn severity category, there was a greater amount of canopy cover than in the moderate soil burn severity. Uh, live ground cover was the greatest in the moderate soil burn severity in 2015 compared to the rest. And the number of florets in sugar mass was greatest in this moderate uh, soil burn severity section again. So there's this trend that the moderate soil burn severity has the greatest effect on live ground cover and the number of florets. So we saw that the environmental attributes that were most 
frequently associated with butterfly occupancy that we measured uh, were canopy cover and live ground cover. Um, we also saw that the association between the butterfly species and the environmental attributes likely changes as time since fire progresses. So we saw different covariates that were associated with the detection and occupancy probability for Icarusia lupinae in 2014 and 2015. Um, there, there were different covariates included in the highest ranked or most supported model for that species. And so as time since fire increases, butterflies are likely keying in on um, additional factors. We also saw that a continuous measure such as the number of florets uh, was a better predictor of occupancy for our focal species than were categorical values of nectar. Covariates that we found that were associated with the abundance of our focal species uh, were canopy cover, live ground cover, and categorical nectar abundance. And so Canopy cover and live ground cover were included um, as affecting the abundance most frequently. Um, and then categorical nectar abundance was also um, more so affected the abundance more than uh, continuous seemed to. And we saw that these nectar measures were more often associated with the abundance of the species than the occupancy status of the species. So they frequently were affecting the abundance of each of our focal species, but not as frequently were associated with the occupancy, uh, if that makes sense. We also saw that fire severity, uh, both vegetation and soil burn severity, affected those same covariates that were important for butterfly occupancy and abundance. And so moderate or high sever fire severity seem to have the largest positive effect for these butterflies. Um, and that could be because um, the moderate and the high severity for both soil and vegetation clears out the greatest amount of um, understory and allows um, mostly forbs to regrow. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, a lot of uh, forb regrowth after the fire um, that led to high amounts of uh, live ground cover estimates. Um, areas where there were a lot of old growth uh, that the fire affected, they tend not to host large number of diversity of butterflies, um, generally speaking, but fire can be used to reset succession and kind of recreate the conditions like we saw that butterflies favor, such as high ground cover or uh, usually forbs, and then those low canopy cover estimates. When you have moderate or high severity fires, opens up the canopy, which butterflies, uh, both occupancy and abundance of butterflies, tend to respond to. Uh, we also saw that um, butterflies were responding to more than just host plants and nectar sources, so we didn't really, we didn't have the opportunity to study um, the host plant abundance of all of these species. Uh, we just didn't have the resources to do that. Um, but butterflies were keying in on other environmental factors um, over both host plant and nectar source abundance. And the abundance The abundance and occupancy of these butterflies, um, some had the same response to these environmental factors and some had different responses. Um, canopy cover and live ground cover tended to be the ones that had uh, at least a similar response in regards to abundance and occupancy. Uh, butterfly abundance and occupancy both seemed to respond similarly in those regards. Um, the abundance of nectar uh, was kind of uh, it was not as, as clear 
There are current projects that are working to restore uh, habitat or manage several endangered and threatened species of butterflies, like I had mentioned. Um, and we saw that high vegetation burn severity, moderate soil burn severity, um, again, had the most favorable impact for these butterfly species. Um, and these this can be taken into account for some of the fire prescriptions that these managers are using. Um, I, through all the literature that I've, that I've gone through, I haven't seen any mention of um, like specific fire prescriptions that, um, that managers are using when they're implementing these prescribed burns. Um, so taking advantage of environmental conditions that allow for the hottest uh, burn possible may be a way to have the greatest impact uh, for the species that they're um, using these prescribed fires for. And with that, I would like to thank the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program for funding, uh, Wild, Wally Dayton Wildlife Fellowship funding, uh, the National Institute of General Medical Science and the National Institute of Health, and finally, Kevin Welch and Lauren Scott for their uh, much support in the field, uh, collecting these data, um, keeping me sane while I was out there, um, and just did a really great job with helping me collect these data. And with that, I will take any questions. Okay, so we're going to switch over to our conclusion slide here in a moment. Um, so think of some questions for Dave, and I, I might get us started with a few housekeeping um, mentions. Um, so, uh, we're going to, like I said, in the chat box on the left, type your any questions for him that we'll have answered in a second here. I do want to point out that we have two web links at the bottom. Um, there's the webinar evaluation, and this is 10 questions that really help us out because we're able to know if something was could be improved in the future, if there's a specific topic you're looking for, and it also helps us to report back and know that webinars are still useful or not useful, that sort of thing. Um, and at the end of this presentation, it, you'll be directed to that evaluation as well. And then the second one is the webinar page. So if you visited our site before with Dave um, for this presentation, you can go to that same page and that will eventually have the recording and the PDF of the slides. So I'm going to open it up for questions now. Okay, um, while we're typing in, I actually had one. I was curious if when you guys were looking at the nectar sources, if you distinguished between native and non-native species? Yeah, so we, uh, of the 20 nectar sources that we recorded, 18 were native and two were non-native. Um, and there is some literature that suggests that butterflies tend to prefer the native sources over the non-native sources, although there hasn't been a lot of research into that. Um, but we couldn't really make any uh, any claims from our research because the abundance of those nectar sources that were non-natives were really low, uh, which is a good thing. But the abundance of those non-native sources throughout the areas where we uh, were doing this research were so low um, that uh, sample sizes are just so low that we couldn't really make any conclusions on that. But and they definitely seem to enjoy the, the native sources that are out there. All right, thanks for that. Um, we have one that's here, I'll paste it in the window here, one second. Have monarch funds to grow milkweed to enhance host and nectar sources? Uh, considering seeding milkweed into small fire areas, any reason I would not want to do that? They're all lo locally collected milkweed and we'd be put back into the same seed zones. And she was thinking uh, they would conclude nectar so include nectar sources, but now understanding they will come in just fine without her help. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, sorry. I kind of missed that. Let me reread that. Um, I mean, that seems... It seems like it would be uh, a good thing to do, especially if they were collected from right there. I don't see any any reason why reseeding with uh, native milkweed seeds uh, into an area 
would have any negative impact. I, I, I think it could only have a positive impact. Um, it's possible that milkweed would come back uh, without the reseeding anyway, but I'm sure reseeding would probably at least speed up the process. So in the initial year following uh, reseeding, you'll probably see more milkweed in there than you would for the, um, you know, if you hadn't reseeded. And like I said, butterflies uh, that we saw tended to be generalists in the field, uh, using pretty much whatever was available to them at the time. Um, and so uh, we didn't find any significant in results that butterflies were keying in on a certain sugar. So any native sources that butterflies have access to, it seems like uh, they were using whenever they were available. So yeah, I don't see um, any problem with, with reseeding. All right, and then we have another person who asked in this, uh, were your observations collected from similar vegetation types? Yeah, so we, uh, we collected all of these data from similar vegetation types at similar elevations. Um, and yeah, so that, yeah, the quick answer to that is yes, we, we kept the vegetation types uh, the same for all of our surveys and only only started transects and ended transects in the same habitat. All right, well, we might end up ending a few minutes early here. So again, please uh, do check out those webinar evaluation links and also eventually the page. And just to remind you, if you did register with the California Fire Science Consortium, I will email you directly with the follow-up link um, when the webinar recording is available. Uh, we do have a thank you from uh, the person from the, the milkweed question. And they also wanted to note, uh, great relevant information for national forests. Interesting to hear because everyone is so scared about high intensity fires. Um, and looks like we might have one more response or question potentially. Also, when I send that follow-up email, if you have other questions you think of, um, feel free to pass those along to either myself and I uh, will also share the contact information. So this conversation yeah. be continued. We have one other thing about the, the high intensity fires. Um, we we saw that the moderate soil burn severity tended to have the greatest uh, positive effect on those uh, covariates for butterflies, um, as opposed to the highest soil burn severity. Um, and that might be due to a few reasons. If the soil layer is burned too severely or too deep, um, some of those native sources, the seed banks, may be affected, um, and so the high intensity fire could ultimately kill them and have more of a negative impact, uh, but definitely for the vegetation above ground uh, burn severity, it seems like um, the higher and the more complete you can burn uh, the vegetation in an area it seems to have the greatest impact on potential regrowth in the area um, and obviously opening up the canopy uh, is those two trends stuck out the most for to our species anyway. So kind of along those same lines, did you have any results specific to sensitive plants coming up after fire? Um, sensitive plants, uh, I guess, um, I don't think any of the sources that we saw could be considered sensitive, um, we did note in the areas where the rim fire occurred that there were several species of orchids that were popping up uh, that the Forest Service was using, um, was putting uh, enclosures around to prevent feeding by cows that were being allowed in these areas. Um, so the orchids seem to be responding pretty well to the fire. Um, but as for what we saw most, yeah, I think 
most of what we saw, I mean, a ton of lupin came up, but I don't think I would consider that a sensitive plant. Um, but, yeah, some of those rarer species tend uh, at least look like they did pretty well. There were a lot of enclosures. And I only know this um, from other sides of my job, but I know that there are people who are out there on the rim fire um, going back this summer even to resurvey vegetation, and so they might be looking more at um, the specific plant species that are coming up. And I'm sure once that research gets out, we'll host it on the California Fire Science Consortium in some format, whether that's a research brief or a webinar. Um, so I also just added one more link down there in the web links, which is our email sign up. I send out a monthly newsletter with notifications about uh, webinars like this, field trips, and new products from the consortia. So uh, feel free to sign up for that to stay in the loop. Um, and it sounds like, so good to know on soil severity too, and looking forward to surveying for butterflies after the 2016 fires. <laughs> it's a never ending job for sure. So um, with that, I think I want to say a giant thank you to Dave for joining us today and sharing this information with us and uh, wish you the best luck in whatever future endeavor comes your way. Uh, thank you. All right. Thanks everyone too for joining. Have a good one.